Today is a very special day for the National Institute of Fundamental Studies, Sri Lanka. All of us are gathered here today in this beautiful setting, physically and also joining in online to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the National Institute of Fundamental Studies. The Institute of Fundamental Studies was established in 1981 by Parliament Act Number 55 with the objective to move the country forward by contributing to the advancement of scientific knowledge. The Institute shifted its location from Colombo to Kandy in 1985, and it was the first step towards building a scientific community, first in the area around Kandy, and then throughout, the Sri, La throughout Sri Lanka with links to the foremost centers of research in all parts of the world. Today, we are honored to have the virtual participation of our chief guest, Honorable Dr. Mrs. Sita Arambepala, State Minister, Ministry of Skill Development, Vocational Education, Research and Innovation, Mrs. Deepa Lienagi, Secretary to the Ministry of Skill Development, Vocational Education, Research and Innovation, and Senior Professor Ranjit Premalal De Silva, Acting Director and the CEO of the National Institute of Fundamental Studies. So, let us now commence the opening of the inauguration ceremony of the 40th anniversary celebrations of NIFS with the traditional lighting of the oil lamp. For that, I cordially invite the following dignitaries who are physically present here with us today. Professor Atul Sumtipala, Chairman of the Board of Governors of the NIFS, Dr. Padmakanta Vanduragala, Secretary to the Board of Governors of the NIFS, Professor Deepa Subhasingha, Co-Chair of the Organizing Committee of the 40th Anniversary Celebrations of NIFS, Professor S. A. Kulasuria, Professor Lakshman Disanayaka, representing the Board of Governors of the NIFS, Professor Rohan Virasuria, representing the Research Council of NIFS, Mr. Kamaki Arya Ratna, representing the non-academic staff of the NIFS, and Mrs. Uh, Mr. Anjana Ratnayaka, representing the Young Scientists Association of the NIFS. Please remain standing for the national anthem. Thank you. 
I cordially invite the acting director and the CEO of, CEO of National Institute of Fundamental Studies of Sri Lanka, Senior Professor Ranjit Premalal Silva, to deliver welcome address. Good morning, a good day to all of you. Let me extend a very warm welcome to all of you. The inauguration of NIFS 40th anniversary commemorations. The NIFS has been magnificently led by the eminent personalities of highest political caliber in this country and nourished by an array of world-renowned Sri Lankan scientists as former directors, such as Professor Chandra Vikramasinghe, Professor Cyril Ponnamperuma, Professor Kirti Tennakon, Professor C. B. Disanayaka, Professor Parakrama Karunaratna, and more recently, Professor Saman Senavira. At the time of commemorating 40 years of our successful contribution to the nation, as the premier fundamental research institute of the country, I believe this is an opportunity for us to have a glimpse of our achievements in the past, evaluate the present national priorities and our potentials to strategize our future directions. Ladies and gentlemen, at present, the NIFS is engaged in basic high caliber research focusing on 17 different thematic areas, focusing on energy and advanced materials, theoretical physics and computational studies, natural products and food chemistry, microbiology and carbon sequestration, earth environmental and biodiversity, molecular biology, 
biotechnology and few other very important disciplines with the research conducted by national institute of fundamental studies so far the institute was able to train about 1500 postgraduate students uh, 1600 undergraduate students and disseminate the information to the scientific community publishing more than 1500 research publications uh, in reputed journals the nifs was successful in developing the first real time database to monitor the compliance of research activities aligned with the vistas of prosperity and splendor and the united nations sustainable development goals the nifs is active round the clock even amidst this covid pandemic to unravel the missing fundamental scientific component which hinders the nation's development and we envision to be a world renowned center of excellence for basic research at this memorable occasion ladies and gentlemen as the director of national institute of fundamental studies let me have your permission to read out a small part of an email i received yesterday from the first director of then ifs professor chandra vikramasinghe who is presently the director of the buckingham center for astrobiology university of buckingham in the united kingdom i quote when i was growing up in the 1960s my adolescence dream was that my native country sri lanka will some day have national institutions dedicated to research in science at the highest level of excellence such institutions had of course existed in other countries then and throughout history for thousands of years but in the 1960s there were none to be found in sri lanka it is our desire as humans to unravel the mysteries of the universe that sets up apart from all other creatures that inhabit our planet I thought then, and still I think, that is the duty of every nation and every government to offer opportunities to enable the fulfilment of this desire. The nascent IFS now, the NIFS, sought to fill this gap, and has done so most admirably over the past four decades. On the occasion of the 40th year of its birth, I wish to congratulate all of you on your truly marvelous progress. For me personally, it is a dream come true. and quote from professor chandra vikram singh who has joined us uh, in this seminar from uh, inauguration from uk with that congratulatory message for our 40th anniversary commemoration for the first director of nifs nifs i take pride in welcoming our chief guest for the event today although we are a little bit late in uh, starting the session honorable minister of skills development vocational education research and innovation consultant dr seetha rampola who has been an inspiration for all of us at nifs ensuring her superlative wisdom to guide us we warmly welcome you madam for this historic event of nifs ladies and gentlemen i welcome secretary of the state ministry mrs deepa leenage who is a great pillar of support for us in all our activities special welcome to our guest speaker today professor prasad katuland who has been associated with nifs more than 3 decades i am sure professor katuland your presentation will educate all of us on non communicable disease control treatment and management i welcome you to this inaugural session i also welcome our chairman and no i don't want to welcome the chairman of nifs because he is the key person instrumental in conceptualizing organizing and implementing the 40th anniversary commemoration program i welcome all former chairpersons of nifs and directors vice chancellors head of institutions and our ministry overseas partners and adjunct research professors and fellows of nifs heads and staff of 
of all our research partner institutions, other invitees, ladies and gentlemen, all are welcome to the inaugural session of NIFS 40th Anniversary Commemoration Session. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Let me now invite the Chairman of the Board of Governors of the NIFS, Professor Atula Sumati Pal, to address the gathering. Thank you. Good day to everybody. The 40th anniversary commemoration of National Institute of Fundamental Studies, inaugural ceremony. I would once again like to welcome the Chief Guest, Dr. Sita Rampola, Honorable State Minister of Skill Development, Vocational Education, Research and Innovation, Mrs. Deepa Lienage, Secretary to the State Ministry, Guest Speaker, Professor Prasad Katulanda, Head of the Department Faculty of Medicine, Senior Professor Ranjit Premlal, District Acting Director of NIFS, all the members of the Board of Governors, Research Council members, Founding Director Professor Chandra Vikram Singh and all the past chairperson and directors, all the other guests and invitees, Professor Deepal Subhasinghe, Chair of the 40 Years Commemoration Committee and its members, all academics and non-academic staff and students, dear colleagues. As you all know, this institution was established through a Parliamentary Act, Act Number 55 in 1981, which was passed initiated in July, passed in September. And as we know, the aim and objectives was to create an interest and to provide facilities and studies, in particular fundamental studies and advanced studies to initiate, promote and conduct research and original investigations in fundamental studies in general, with particular emphasis on mathematics, physics, chemistry, but I want to reiterate and highlight life sciences and social sciences, and philosophy. Later, the act was amended in 1997 to say it's taken in the broader sense, all these subjects. So it's not just laboratory sciences, it's, it's the very important, every aspect of life to be researched. And the first inaugural chairman was the former president, Jaya Jayavadana. We may have political differences with him, but this is one of the most inspiring uh, steps he has taken as the president of the country at that time. I really appreciate that. Then the brainchild behind the whole concept was Professor Chandra Vikram Singh, along with Professor Mailvanagam and Professor Amrasekara and few others who had contributed to conceptualizing this institution of fundamental studies at that time. And his tenure was taken over by Professor Cyril Ponampirimo from 1984 until 1991. I'm not going to read this because the director has already uh, read through his email. But again, this was the origin of the institution, which was a great requirement at that time. Now to follow all the chairpersons until 19. 2015 were the presidents in the country and subsequent chairpersons were Professor Samaratunga, Professor Vikram Singh, Professor Vijay Kumar and Professor Janaka Ekanayaka along with the list of directors who served and contributed to the development of the IFS which was NIFS later as mentioned by our director Professor Prem Lal Silva. Now, the Institute of Fundamental Studies was actually established on the 4th of February, 1982. This is again a landmark event because all of us know it was our Independence Day. So at that time, to dedicate that day to open National Institute of Fundamental Studies was a remarkable thing that itself shows how important the whole concept was considered by President Javadan at that time. And the board meetings were held. You can see the board room and the, the office of Professor Chandra Vikram Singha and Professor Cyril Ponam Peruma, which to date we use as our Colombo office. Then, as the director mentioned and Chalani mentioned, it was shifted to Candy 
these were the old building renovated and the new building came up i'm just going through very briefly the history but it's beyond mere physical structure a lot of contribution for a lot of personalities at that time to the country now based on that very brief past which i mentioned which is much more than a marathon we are planning to commemorate the establishment of ifs and nifs over the next 6 months with many events monthly event hosted by each of six research clusters science education activities in parallel with science month in november press conferences tv programs utb interviews on both scientific and social events launching the eureka vidus setta lottery which we intend to establish an independent funding to generate funding for research and also to establish collaborations within the country commemor to issue a commemorative stamp to mark the event open day for the general public and students of course depending on the pandemic situation and and the progress of vaccination program youtube documentary series symposium on ancient and tra traditional wisdom which is extremely important with our long standing history of this country a coffee table book which will be the left legacy of 40th anniversary for generations to read because it's extremely important monthly event a guest talk by a leading scientist in the area of specialization hosted by each research cluster young scientists association international symposium in september school science program understanding the world through science involving school children competitions short video competition in parallel with science week and finally we intend if everything improves to invite his excellency the president for event in colombo to mark the climax of this six months of celebrations i know it's a lot but we want to do it why why do we want to commemorate it's not just to celebrate what was done but to critically reflect i emphasize the word critically reflect and learn from the past to guide us on future directions that's why we need to reflect which is very important as you all know in ifs as our director reiterated it's an institution with a proud history a center of excellence for basic and advanced research which has a track record for cutting edge research supporting and nurturing future research leaders but let's see what is there for the people now for us yes phd's patents job promotions international conference travel or what is beyond us that's what i would want to propose a culture shift research for people's benefit i'm not saying 40 years of nifs history has not done that but we have to make a bigger leap as professor chandra vikram singh had stated in his email we need a culture shift culture shift for people to benefit beyond our academic achievements and benefits that bring us the academics the glory the promotions the paper they are important but at the same time if we can't make a difference for the people to me as a scientist it's not sufficient why beyond us because we most of us are the beneficiaries of public education we use public funding taxpayers money the limited resources a state would have and also public knowledge we carry forward the knowledge generated by other people that's why it's very important to document and leave thesis papers all that but we are indebted to the people who have actually contributed for us to carry this legacy so therefore we are accountable not only the politicians we are accountable to the people we are accountable to the researchers who has 
done our foreigners. So therefore, it's our ultimate supreme duty to leave benefits for the people, for the country, for the nation and beyond to make a difference. When I went through the history, I realized on the left hand corner, you would see one of the aims at that time, 30, 40 years ago, to foster public understanding of science. And there had been public series of lectures. And in fact, President himself, Jayadavadana, had given a lecture. This is exactly what we are trying to talk. But I want to propose that we should involve and engage the public more. There are two different things. Involving is just, you know, they are passive partners. They are recipients of benefits. They are witnesses of what is happening. They support us. But engagement is a different thing. They become true partners. They become contributors, not only just passive beneficiaries. They are active contributors to development of knowledge, share the knowledge and dissemination knowledge, and particularly making a difference through implementation sciences, service development, and product development. So that's to do that successfully, to sell a product, scientific product we make, we need partners who will buy that concept and carry forward for us. So therefore, we reflect and decide on the future directions. That is the culture shift I propose, which is research for people's benefit. It's particularly important. Consider the political con uh, context. So our strategic approach should be aligned with the, the vistas of prosperity and splendor of Bakya Dekma. Why? Research and development, innovation and technology transfer. The post-industrial knowledge economy today clearly displays the close correlation among economic growth, innovation and indigenous research capacity. University-based research has been the most effective driver of such economy relevant innovation. As a result, leveraging the public investment in universities to stimulate innovative research and development is now critically needed for a country to remain competitive in the global arena. The most high ranking universities in Asia has transformed from teaching universities to research universities in keeping with the global trend, which is we see in the West. That's why we all were the beneficiaries of a vaccine within one year in spite of the whole global divide of research science, which 90% of research come from 10% of countries. But we need to reverse that. Sri Lanka need a paradigm shift to make the research and innovation co component of undergraduate and postgraduate education, which is happening under the leadership of our honorable state minister, Dr. Sita Rambipola. I'm glad that it's happening in Sri Lanka, a dream becoming a reality. And in order to produce individuals with both creative vision and for innovation, as well as sufficient intellectual breadth and depth to realize that vision. So why is what is a strategy? Strategy is about capturing opportunities arising in a dynamic world. So therefore, we need flexibility to respond to novel ideas with solid potential for success. For example, COVID-19, as I mentioned, has created an unprecedented window of opportunity for research, which is still not explored adequately. Sri Lanka requires innovative R&D contribution to re-establish the economy, to ensure national security, and for sustainable development in strategically important areas such as organic farm. That's what I mean by research for people's benefit. To do that, vision, strategy, focus, success is not sufficient. Attitudes are the most important thing. So that's what we need for a culture shift. Change in attitudes. Can't do. No money. And research only for the benefits of academics, for intellectual glorification. I'm not saying our scientists are doing that. But we have to think beyond ourselves. That culture shift, why? Attitude change, a bad attitude is like a flat tire to me. You can't get anywhere without change. So it's crucial the leaders, the research leaders for this country should be people who can change the attitude, 
people who feel learned helplessness. We are facing huge challenges because of COVID. Less money funding, but we need to bet on. We need to do more research with less money, little money. Money is not everything. We need to generate money. And that is very crucial. So therefore, my last few slides, what is our duty is to create a good team in an IFS and good teams in the country and an ethos. What, I, what do I mean by the ethos? A place where people feel home. People feel everybody belongs somewhere in that institution. Dr. Premalaldi Silva, I am very grateful to you within your short period of time here. You have supported me to create that environment, this institution, and everybody feels it's their home, they have a place. That's why we have successfully launched this operation today. In that team, there should be visionaries, but visionaries alone wouldn't be sufficient. I suppose Professor Chandra Vikram Singh was one of those visionaries. And theoreticians, our scientists, but we need activists, young scientists who learn to become future leaders. On top of all that pragmatics. To me, politicians are pragmatic people who have to balance everything. And thanks, our state minister again, for your pragmatic approach and also His Excellency the President for supporting us in this endeavor. Now, I'm just going to show you something which I love. I don't know whether it will work. Yes, it should. This is what I mean by teamwork. Chaotic disease. Just spend the next 30 seconds. Chaotic. The vehicle is moving very slow. They can't start off. It took such a long time to take it forward. See here the difference of teamwork. They are ready. They are perfecting. They are waiting for the vehicle to come. Everything is organized. Everybody has been assigned the role. They know what they have to do. Vehicle arrives. Tires start change in no time. It's take off. So this is a dynamic and efficient team. So final slide. The art of science will make that difference, crucial difference of making that culture shift for people's benefit. You all are scientists who know science to the maximum. But we need to invest more on the art of science, thinking differently, doing things differently, taking up challenges when we are hardest hit. That's a scientist. A scientist to me is not only somebody who has a great brain, but who has a strong spine, thick skin, which is needed in that challenge against time. Thank you all for giving me this opportunity and asking me to speak a few words. And I want to thank particularly the, the, the real vote of thanks will be done by our co-chair. But I want to thank the committee, particularly Professor Lakshman Disanayak, Professor Sivir Vijay Sundar, Professor Kulasuri, Professor Iqbal, Dr. Kumari and Dr. Shalini and the Science Dissemination Unit and everybody who contributed with supported Professor Deepal to make this event a success. Thank you very much. Look forward to the day and working with you all over the next few months. Thank you. Thank you very much for the motivation and encouraging words, sir. Our chief guest, Honorable Dr. Sita Arambekala and Mrs. Deepa Lienage joined with us in the morning and due to the delay occurred, unfortunately, they had to leave the session to attend to prior assigned duties. Therefore, we will now move on to the most awaited event on today's agenda. It is the keynote address by the keynote speaker, Vidya Jyoti, Professor Prasad Katulani. 
Let me now take the privilege to introduce Professor Khatulanda. Vidya Jyoti Professor Prasad Khatulanda is a professor in medicine, head of the Department of Clinical Medicine, University of Colombo. He is a consultant, endocrinologist, and diabetologist. Professor Katulanda obtained his MBBS from the University of Colombo and his PhD from the University of Oxford, United Kingdom. Professor Katulanda is the Honorary Vice President of the Endocrine Society of Sri Lanka and the Honorary Assistant Secretary to the Sri Lankan Medical Association and the country di director for the Asian Collaboration for Excellence in Non-Communicable Disease Program. He is well known as an excellent researcher in non-communicable disease pro researcher and his work has primarily been focused on treatments and mitigations of non-communicable diseases in Sri Lanka. And he has published a number of research papers over with over 6,000 citations in the fields of endocrinology and diabetology. Professor Katulanda joined the NIFS, then IFS, in 1988 as a pre-university research associate, where he initiated his research career. Today, we are honored to have him with us on this special occasion as we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the NIFS, and he will be delivering a lecture on application of diabetes and non-communicable disease research of Sri Lankan populations. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. First of all, let me uh, thank the organizing committee for inviting me to uh, speak to you all today. Honorable Dr. Sita Arambepola, State Minister of the Ministry of Skill Development, Vocational Education, Research and Innovation, the Secretary. Chairman NIFS, Professor Atula Sumutipala, Director NIFS, Senior Professor Ranjit Premaldi Silva, Co-Chair of the Organizing Committee, Professor Deepal Subasinghe and the Organizing Committee, Ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, share my slides with you. So again, um, it's a great pleasure, again, a privilege to be speaking as the keynote speaker at the 40th anniversary of the commencement of uh, the NIFS, which was initially uh, started as IFS. It's like coming home. And let me start my talk on application of diabetes and NCD research to Sri Lankan population. So uh, if you know, uh, look at the need and types of health research, we need to identify health problems which uh, causes uh, mortality and the suffering to people. So you need population research, which we call uh, also epidemiological research to identify, quantify problems. And also in that process, we might get some insights through the causation, uh, like the risk factors, etiology, and so on. And then we need more investigations uh, particularly lab-based in investigations where fundamental and laboratory research becomes important to identify molecular level mechanisms uh, in the causation of disease, as well as in developing uh, treatments like uh, drugs, medications, uh, and also diagnostic tools uh, for detection of disease. And then comes clinical research where we want to uh, further understand how a particular treatment works or how a diagnostic tool is used best and uh, whether it is useful or useless, all this comes under clinical research. And then uh, where we further evaluate the usefulness of either treatments, 
evaluations or even preventive measures uh, at uh, the implementation level, the implementation research becomes important. So let me first uh, show you a few things to make it more uh, contextually uh, appropriate. And you can see here the population pyramid in 1981. See, very few old people lived at that time and mostly there were, they were others for children or young adults. And things changed like that uh, by, by 2001, this became, uh, you know, the shape change. And more and more older people uh, started to be uh, living in the society. And now if you take uh, today, this may be even more. So we are a rapidly aging society. Along with demographic transitions, the epidemiological transitions also started to happen, particularly with the increasing in the living conditions where uh, things like malaria, which were killing hundreds of thousands of people and e even changing um, the, our uh, civilizations from like um, Anuradhapura and downwards uh, started to go away. And we have now successfully eradicated endogenous malaria. We see only imported cases today. And you can see what is happening to the diabetes at, at the level of the global context. From 2000 to today, in about 20 years, it has increased about 300%. And this is going to be further increasing uh, by a few more decades. And this is the world diabetes map. Initially, diabetes was considered a problem of the West and industrialized countries and the, uh, the white Caucasians. But epidemiological research proved otherwise, particularly towards the uh, last two decades. The epidemiological study showed that South Asians are a very vulnerable population, particularly in the type two diabetes. We know diabetes is where the blood glucose remains higher than normal in our circulation. And it can lead to acute metabolic complications like diabetes coma, ketoacidosis, and also more commonly, particularly in the type 2 diabetes, uh, long-standing high blood glucose leads to chronic organ dysfunction and subsequently failure. Things which are unique to diabetes, we know uh, the diabetic retinopathy, which can cause even blindness, diabetic neuropathy, which causes uh, loss of sensation of our feet and subsequent loss of feet, and even uh, other issues like erectile dysfunction, which leads to uh, more societal problems, and then uh, the nephropathy, which leads to kidney failure. In addition, diabetes people are vulnerable to develop atherosclerotic disease where their big blood vessels get clogged with cholesterol rich deposits and then subsequent blockade, which can lead to heart attack or brain attack, we call a stroke. And also this can affect our blood vessels in the leg where we can suddenly lose a limb. So it is, we call a multi-system disease. There are many types of diabetes. Type one is predominantly due to absolute insulin deficiency due to the damage occurring uh, to our beta cells in the pancreas that produces insulin uh, from antibodies that develops against these cells. So there's no insulin. Insulin is like a key which opens a lock and this opening of the lock is to open the of door, and as a result, the glucose enters cells. So when there's no key, the doors remain uh, shut, and the glucose remains in the circulation with high blood glucose. And this occurs predominantly in children and young adults due to an autoimmune process. The common type two diabetes, which is predominantly um, uh, which predominantly affects old people, 
the problem is not uh, the deficiency of insulin predominantly it is the uh, functioning of the insulin so you have insulin the key you have the uh, the receptor or the lock it doesn't fit properly initially so there's insulin resistance which leads to again non opening of the gates and glucose being high in the circulation type 2 diabetes is predominantly occurring in adults associated with obesity sedentary lifestyle uh, and due to insulin resistance coupled with insulin deficiency and a similar mechanism leads to diabetes occurring in the pregnancy we call it gestational diabetes with risk to the mother and the fetus and there are other specific types of diabetes some due to genetic defects of insulin production some due to de genetic defects of insulin action some defects uh, due to problems in the pancreas which leads to the production of insulin and some due to drugs and so on these are the ones coming to chronic non communicable diseases is accounting to about 80% of deaths particularly in the developing countries and these four chronic ncds chronic respiratory disease diabetes cardiovascular disease and lifestyle related cancers are due to four preventable risk factors tobacco smoking unhealthy diet lack of exercise and excess consumption of alcohol so i told you about this 80% business and also earlier ncds occurred mostly in older people who were not contributing to the production of the country but now we increasingly see ncds and diabetes affecting the people who are younger less than 70 years and we call it premature deaths and premature suffering and can affect the economy and the development of the country and the society so when i embarked on uh, my research career this is uh, before uh, around 2004 actually we didn't have a very robust country wide data on the prevalence of diabetes the world health organization and the international diabetes federation used data from uh, urban slums in thailand to calculate our diabetes prevalence in this famous paper and so therefore our estimates and projections were not accurate therefore there was a need for comprehensive epidemiological study and also there was no national representative data on different types of diabetes there was hardly any knowledge about genetics of diabetes in south asians including sri lankans and these things were thought of as huge challenges due to the cost and lack of expertise also we didn't know whether we were a obese society or not and also there was a lot of controversy about whether the way the who and the uh, the western countries classified obesity is applicable to sri lankans and other south asians we uh, conducted this large epidemiological study unfortunately we could not do it in the north and the east at that time due to the existing war at that time and you can see some pictures of our teams going into even rural areas um, the collecting data and in this seminal paper in 2006 uh, we publish uh, very important data for sri lanka and showed that about 1/10 of adult population has diabetes and about 1/3 of them did not know diabetes and this increased with age which was a common knowledge but showed very exponential increase with age in our population and showed that there's still a marked difference between urban and rural areas and we were able to map the diabetes prevalence in different uh, provinces and you can see that the prevalence nicely fits in with the level of urbanicity with highest in the western then central southern then sabaragamu northwestern north central and ur and also showed that the in the interventions we need to take uh, account about the other distributions like 
increase in prevalence in the Sri Lankan Moor population. Uh, and also we needed to know more deeper to see the real picture and uh, looked at the pre-diabetes. And you can see the overall pre-diabetes, which uh, accounts for all the people with abnormal fasting glucose in between the normal and the diabetes range, and what's called the impaired glucose tolerance, which is after giving glucose uh, 75 grams as a drink, the two hour value, which is again intermediate, and all these together also accounted to about another 11%. So altogether, about one fifth of the Sri Lankans were not having normal blood glucose regulation. Also, we did a lot of uh, other statistics to find out risk factors. You can see the family history, the nicely, uh, the, uh, in both men and women, the presence of family history makes you at risk more than two times. And also, you can see with the increase in body mass index, as shown in the x-axis, the prevalence increases exponentially, and particularly this jump of the prevalence occurs around a BMI of 18. BMI of 18, we might consider thin at modern context. And you can see the comparison uh, with Western data. This is uh, the famous nurses' sales study from United States. You see the real increase uh, in these people happens around a BMI of around 25 compared to 18 in our people. So uh, also we showed the importance of physical activity. You can see the most active group has the lowest diet prevalence from the active group and the interaction of the physical activity uh, and the uh, body mass index. Here, this is the group with the lowest BMI uh, and uh, lowest waist circumference and uh, highest level of physical activity. Compare that with the group with highest base circumference and the highest uh, lowest level of physical activity. The, see the difference in the diabetes prevalence. Coming to the genetics of diabetes, we know that the genotype is our, like the birth certificate, our genetic identity. And the phenotype is what manifests like the, our height, color, and the behavior, disease status, and so on. The genetically based diseases can occur due to chromosomal disorders, due to single gene disorders, or due to multiple gene disorders we call complex traits. Diabetes is a classic example. So why should we should know about the diabetes or genes due to uh, responsible for any other uh, chronic NCD? If we know the risk, uh, genetic risk, we can predict uh, the disease early and even take uh, correctable measures or preventive measures. And also uh, we can better understand the pathophysiology at molecular level, and perhaps might also help in individualization of therapy, uh, as well as uh, development of drug targets. We call it pharmacogenetics. There are two main methods of looking at diabetes genes in the, First method called candidate gene approach, we usually suspect that this gene, because its mechanism involves a particular disease process. For instance, we might suspect that a gene that encodes for the insulin receptor might be responsible for diabetes because of its mechanism in the, uh, the involvement of glucose control, and then look at that gene. We call this candidate gene appro uh, approach. It is like you use one light to find a lost key. And by this way, it takes a long period to look for uh, find genes. Another novel technique that was coming up uh, was called the genome wide association studies, where you used like multiple lights to find a lost key. And here, what we do is we rapidly scan for multiple genetic variations across sets of DNA samples from many people. Uh, and this is very useful for uh, complex multiple 
uh, gene polygenic disorders like diabetes, asthma, cancer, heart disease, hypertension. What is done is there are things called uh, DNA chips, so microarrays, where uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, single nucleotides are embedded there. And uh, when the sample is run, it uh, detects abnormalities at a given time. And uh, so we using all these techniques, we embarked on our work on genetics of diabetes. And uh, in addition to the, the study I have already showed, we also used other studies like the young diabetes study where we recruited a thousand uh, sample of people who developed diabetes less than 40 years and above 16. And particularly because we thought that they might have higher risk genes and then uh, use many genetic methods like the uh, uh, extraction, PCR, re real-time PCR. Everybody talks about this because of the COVID uh, screening and DNA sequencing and the various chips like Illumina chip for GWA studies. And then um, came up with some seminal papers like this paper on mitochondrial diabetes among South Asians and Sri Lankans, where we were able to show that about 1% of uh, overall diabetes in the young is due to mitochondrial diabetes, and they have characteristic clinical features compared to the others. And also, uh, we um, did a lot of work on this maturity on diabetes of the young uh, in uh, younger, uh, young onset diabetic uh, patients. And also, uh, we used other methods to find out risk genes uh, for type 2 diabetes and also contributed to these uh, very uh, seminal papers uh, which were uh, published in esteemed journals like Nature Genetics on um, G1 wide scans, um, finding new loci for type 2 diabetes, which were also highlighted in uh, the media at that time. And also we were able to contribute uh, uh, to uh, knowledge where the different subtypes of diabetes in the Sri Lankan population. And you can see here different subtypes based on uh, these autoantibodies and other molecular markers, type 2, and then various other subtypes, which I'm not going to details. Particularly when it comes to epidemiological research, just a one-off research won't be adequate because the epidemiology changes. You need to see the disease trends, patterns, changing uh, risk factors. So uh, in keeping with that need, we uh, also repeated some of our work on epidemiology and in the Sri Lanka non-communicable disease study, which we were unable to complete in the whole country due to the financial constraints. Uh, however, we managed to do in the Western province, you can see uh, about one fifth of the people already knew that they had uh, got diabetes. And also with those who were detected by our studies, uh, you can see nearly about 30% had diabetes. This is among adults about uh, 20 years in the Colombo district. And you can see nearly about 40% had pre-diabetes. So if you take uh, like a urbanized area like Colombo district, only about 30% is having normal blood glucose regulation. So the, that, is, that level is, um, the situation is worse to that level. Obesity, we thought that we were not an obese population a few decades ago. We know obesity is one of the major risk factors for most of the NCDs and including cancer. So we embarked on uh, looking at cutoffs for defining obesity in Sri Lankans. And we showed that the cutoff should be much lower than what is existingly used by agencies like the World Health Organization. You can see um, the real risk of uh, increasing cardiovascular disease occurs at a BMI of around 2021 20, and a waist circumference of around 77, which is very much thinner levels. These for females, not much different. And then also we showed that 
even being a low middle income country about 35% was either overweight or obese and this is much commoner in the urban areas where it comes to about 50%. And actually compared with that, you can see uh, these are figures again from Sri Lanka Uncommunicable Disease Study done in 2018. Uh, whereas you can see the prevalence of either overweight and obesity together uh, in particularly in female, you can see about 70%. This is much, much higher than what we saw uh, about 15 years ago. And these are the risk factors for uh, obesity, uh, quite uh, traditional, but as well as uh, you know ethnicity, but we were not able to do studies on diet at that time. Again, we looked at the prevalence of hypertension and showed its association, particularly with the age. And you can see the data for hypertension again now, about close to about 50% of the adult population is uh, becoming hypertensive. And we look at the adequacy of control and other risk factors which are important like smoking. Again, uh, showing that it's predominantly a male problem. Ischemic heart disease, this is actually not the incidence but the prevalence which will underestimate because some people die uh, before coming to hospitals. Again, however, you can see that with increasing age, it's also becoming a huge problem. So these are all to be anticipated to get worse because we are a rapidly aging population. Also, uh, developing younger researchers, I was able to continue some more work on nutrition and also see, looking to see whether endogenously available things like uh, cinnamon can be used to manage diabetes, there's some uh, initial quite promising data on cinnamon on uh, diabetes and lipid control, which we have published. Then looking at interventions using M Health, um, digital health, and also particularly looking at complications like uh, neuropathy and its effects on falls. And uh, in this uh, paper published in the Journal of Lipidology, we were able to describe the lipid issues, lipid patterns in Sri Lanka. So in addition to what we have already done, we wanted to see what new uh, areas of research we need to undertake. We wanted to see whether we can prevent diabetes in the community. So we are part of a larger group of uh, researchers from UK, Pakistan, India, and Sri Lanka together, looking at the prevention of diabetes uh, in the community level with, with lifestyle interventions. And then um, also the studies have shown that if you lose a lot of weight, particularly at the initial stages after development of diabetes, now here you can see, this is the amount of weight loss on the x-axis and the percentage remission means being free of diabetes. So if you lose about 15 kilos, there's a chance about 86% being free of diabetes. So we have embarked on um, work on this remission uh, studies uh, to see whether that can be a paradigm shift in the way we manage diabetes. Then came the COVID and we wanted to look at things like how to manage uh, and prevent COVID and COVID deaths in people with diabetes and the impact on the hormone system, the endocrine system. And also when it comes to research, it is not a good thing just for you to do research alone. It is very important to nurture and mentor future generations so that you can really multiply by several fold the research output. So in that way, I had been able to um, get a lot of uh, uh, good, bright uh, people uh, trained in research. And most of these people are either specialists in medicine or uh, eminent researchers in Sri Lanka or elsewhere in the world, uh, also still uh, having collaborations with us. And ladies and gentlemen, 
in conclusion of my uh, particular subject today we are having a huge epidemic of diabetes and other ncds which were underestimated uh, by international agencies but uh, happy that we were able to correct with endogenous data and we were able to uh, contribute to the risk factors uh, and also etiological subtypes and genetics and understanding of molecular mechanisms and uh, some of which i am quite sure led to the subsequent developments in the ministry of health uh, where they established the ncd unit now it's a bureau working on the ncd understanding the importance of ncds and then uh, subsequently led to the revision of the who and idf estimates and projections particularly in diabetes using our own data and then a uh, lot of modifications happened in the healthcare system particularly aiming at uh, the ncds like the uh, healthy lifestyle centers and so on and also uh, stimulating more practical uh, and cost effective risk uh, methods uh, evaluation for early detection and prevention of diabetes and ncds now let me just briefly uh, before i wind up tell a little bit of my um, involvement and my um, journey with ifs so actually when i was finishing my school uh, education i had a dream to be a, a doctor and a scientist and uh, one of the role models was uh, none other than professor sir ponnampermu who was a world renowned scientist uh, who uh, had brought a lot of fame to sri lanka and then um, it was uh, uh, such a coincidence that there was closure of the schools for two years uh, due to the problems we had in late 80s where i had the opportunity to uh, arrive at ifs here you can see the students at uh, that year who got uh, four a's for all subjects in all the disciplines with professor pornam peruma and Arthur, uh, dr atha clark uh, where we were brought in and given opportunities to work in research uh, and has early research exposure not only research actually uh, we were involved in organizing science parks in gamudava this is uh, in the uh, the kamburupitiya gamudava site where i was you know manning uh, uh, ifs stall where this was actually also brought, uh, uh, made by ourselves and then it's not only uh, the work and research we also had a lot of fun you can see some of uh, very prominent medical consultants and engineers in the country researchers and you can see the co chair of this symposium professor deepal here uh, some of the others are in the scattered in the rest of the world and again a similar picture here and um, so i'm uh, quite you know grateful to ifs and other mentors like professor pannam perma professor shanti mendis and from my own department like professor sheriff professor saroj professor sham fernando and for the, from the university of oxford uh, and a uh, few institutions uh, including uh, where i started my school education royal college then the ifs from there i went to the colombo medical school the university and then the national hospital of sri lanka the university of oxford all of which has helped me to achieve uh, many uh, things in research as well as uh, particularly other uh, accolade likes my vidya jyoti title so ladies and gentlemen we are in a situation like this we are a, a tsunami of diabetes and ncds is going to overwhelm us now uh, here actually people might not have much of a choice rather than getting early getting to know early and fleeing the city to save lives but in this tsunami of uh, diabetes and ncds if we stand tall and strong and work together we should be able to fight this uh, ncd and diabetes tsunami and that is where the role of the researchers also becomes important 
and very very uh, you know uh, appreciate uh, should be appreciated uh, and we should all uh, try to promote uh, basic research clinical research applied and implementation research uh, to find new answers to this ever increasing issues uh, in diabetes and ncds and i would like to again thank uh, the chairman uh, the director and the organizing committee and all of you for uh, inviting me as well as the patient listening thank you very much thank you very much sir for your informative talk on your impressive work in the field of diabetes research in sri lanka and also sharing with us about your time at the nifs nifs as a pre university associate it was very impressive to mark the conclusion of the inauguration ceremony now i would like to invite co chair of the organizing committee of the 40th anniversary celebrations of the nifs professor deepa subasinghe to deliver the vote of thanks uh, thank you Vidya Jyoti Professor Prasad Katlan for your excellent for me to talk. Uh, this concludes the inauguration session and the first lecture of the important series of events we have arranged to commemorate the 40th years of existence of our institute. We have planned a series of events to celebrate the 40th anniversary of our institute in the next few months of this year. It is my pleasure to be the co-chair of the 40th anniversary commemorative committee. First and foremost, I would like to thank our chief guest, Honorable Dr. Sita Rampala, State Minister of Skills Development, Vocational Education, Research and Innovation, for gracing this event. Uh, unfortunately, due to this uh, unexpected technical hiccup, uh, she was not able to give her speech today. i apologize on behalf of the committee my sincere thanks also go to ms deepa lienage the secretary of the state ministry for participation and making uh, accepting to give a short address again uh, because of the technical issues we could not have a talk professor atul sumati pala the chairman of the nifs is specially thanked for initiating this idea to commemorate the 40th anniversary of NIFS about a year ago and from proposing to organize today's event and his untiring support and supervision throughout he is also the chairman of the organizing committee and involved even in the finer details of the organization of today's event without his constant encouragement and dedication and interest i'm sure that this event would not see the light of day thank you sir. the acting director senior professor panjit premalal de silva provided enormous support and assistance right from the beginning to make this event a success obviously without director's continuous logistic support and advice we would not have been able to conduct these events so my sincere thanks go to him i'm grateful to vidya jyoti prasad prasad katulanda for accepting our invitation to deliver the keynote address and sharing his expertise with us thank you prasad katulanda for uh, inspiring talk and bringing back those uh, fond memories of old age i must thank dr anduragala the secretary of to the board of governors for his support and interest in this event as a person who joined the ifs initially as a research assistant in late 1980 i have been i have seen the development of the institute over the last four years i would like to take this opportunity also to thank all the former chairpersons directors secretaries and the members of the board of governors for making the ifs what it is today I should thank all the organizing committee members 
former senior professors to research assistant sorry from senior professors to research assistant who keep supporting me throughout the process my sincere thanks go to the scdu team led by dr kumari tilakaratna for all the hard work in organizing arranging and advertising as well as all physical work to make this event a success big thank go to dr shalini rajakarna for all your work and for being the master of ceremony the compute unit of the ifs especially thank for their hard work especially at the last moment when we had the, some technical issues i must extend my thanks to all the scientists and research staff technical staff administrative staff account division library reception cleaning staff as well as security for their role in providing support at various stages last but not least i thank all those who joined this event physically or virtually to make this event a success thank you very much thank you professor deepa i hope you all had a fruitful time this at this session while thanking you for being with us today i hope to see you all joining with us in the future events of the series of events of the nifs 40th anniversary celebration thank you very